Hey guys, welcome back. It's been a long time, I apologize, not because you couldn't live without a video from me, but mostly because of all the bad weather that I've caused of late. Lord knows, over the past 11 weeks, I've had maybe four imaging nights, and I've completed zero projects since I wanted to make some changes, and I'm pretty sure I'm to blame for this after all of the new stuff that I bought. I went out and bought some Antlia filters and wanted to share with you my experience with them. Can't do that. Bought the ADM saddle replacement and wanted to share with you my experience with that. I can do that. Wanted to start using the focal reducer with my SCT. Nope, can't do that. Zero completed projects. And I also bought an ASI 294mm and have managed to take a picture of a chimney across the way. And that's about all I've got to say about that. And finally, I wanted to use Hocus Focus for the first time. And I have been able to do that a little bit with my SCT. So few things I want to share with you in my experience with some of these things. And finally, just because we're coming to the end of galaxy season, I want to go over my planning procedure to find the last galaxy of the season, and hopefully I'll be able to collect some data on it before the end of June. Okay, so let's get started. One of the first things I did was make an adjustment to the RA axis back here. You can look back in my previous video to see a link to another video that shows you how to do that. But I finally was able to back off this nut back here, which takes a lot of pressure off of the bearings you can just see back beyond there. And that will ease up the rotation of the RA axis, which in turn allows you to get much easier balance. And I have very much appreciated the ability to get much better balance now after backing off this nut. Another thing that I added was the ADM saddle. I took off the original saddle that came with the EQ6R. It's longer, it has larger knobs, and it's perfectly machined so that there is no tendency for it to cause rotation of the OTA during insertion and removal of the OTA. What I did find with this, it, it is not self-balanced, and so as a result, when the OTA is in home position, meaning counterweights down and the, and the scope is pointing toward the pole, uh, there is a tendency as you stand behind the mount that the deck will rotate. Uh, even though it's balanced in deck in this orientation, it will rotate on you toward the east or off to the to your right as you stand looking at the telescope. And so what I've had I've had to do is to reinsert these small rig uh, masses, these counterweights. You look them up on Amazon, just look up small rig and counterweight and it'll take you right to a link for something like this. And so what I do is take a little all thread here. This is a quarter 20 all thread. It's uh, held in place by some clamps on this uh, ADM bar that I use to support my OTA, connect to the OTA, and that's what interfaces with the saddle. But I use this uh, small rig mass offset to the side here and that it's what I'm using to maintain effective deck balance in all orientations. So it needs to be balanced in deck as you're uh, in home position, and it needs to be balanced in deck when you're off to the side like this. They have a uh, threaded hole on one end for a quarter 20 rod, and on the other end there's a quarter 20 stud. So if you needed to add another weight, you just take another one of these weights and screw it onto the end of this one, and you can get more weight. I've had a really good experience after making the adjustment to the RA axis and getting good balance. And I, if there's only one slight knock I have against this saddle is that I wish it were kind of self-balanced so that it didn't contribute to any tendency for the scope to want to rotate off to the side. Now, one of the main reasons, though, for making this adjustment, which you also want to see, is better guiding performance. Before I did the RA adjustment, this was kind of the behavior I was getting before I made this adjustment. I was getting a guiding less than 0.56 arc seconds 80% of the time. After making this adjustment, looking at a good seeing day, I was getting about 0.48 arc seconds 80% of the time, when I was getting fair to poor seeing, my guiding jumped up to about 0.69 arc seconds. On another night, also with fair to poor seeing, again, 0.68 arc seconds 80% of the time. I think the jury is still out on whether or not I'm getting any improved guiding by making this adjustment to this RA nut, but I hope to see with uh, the coming days and better seeing conditions in the future, be able to make a more definitive statement about the effect of this adjustment on my guiding. Well, at least one good thing, I finally was able to make full use of Hocus Focus during some of these recent imaging nights. I'm using Hocus Focus for the star detector, for the star annotator, and for autofocus. I'm having it annotate the image, and I have been playing around with these numbers for the stretch factor and the black clipping number, because after all, Nina is sending 
the stretched image to the autofocus routines to uh, find stars and evaluate their focus. So this is a player. Don't use these numbers. These numbers are not magic. I've been playing around with them to some effect to see what the effects are. But in addition, I have been operating uh, hopefully in the simple-minded mode. So I've turned the advanced mode off. The one thing I have done is set the pixel scale to a long focal length for this SCT. And then some of the results I've gotten have actually been very good. Uh, you see on the these numbers over here represent the R-square values that I calculate as well as the optimum focus position. A string of autofocus runs that I made during one night and another string of autofocus runs I made during another night. And as you can see, all of the data uh, look great. But you can see my R-squared values are all above about 0.97 is the lowest that I got. Totally on board with Hocus Focus. Working great. If you're not using it yet or you think it might be too much trouble to fine-tune it, don't worry about it. Just jump in and give it a try with the default values. If you're using a long focal link system, maybe try this number. If you're still having problems getting it to detect stars, maybe play around with this a little bit. Now, one of the things that I really, really wanted to do was to compare a picture I took just recently this galaxy season with the SCT at its full focal length in Ben 1 mode using the ZWO filters, and in this case you can see it's M82, and then I wanted to compare a similar photo of M82 at the, with the focal reducer installed, possibly in Ben 2 mode, and yet using the Antlia filters. The Antlia SHO filters are 3 nanometer, and the ZWO HA filter, in this case is what I'm using here, is 7 nanometers. So I wanted to be able to compare the 3 nanometer filters with the 7 nanometer filters, and of course just RGB filters and Antlia to the ZWO RGB filters. But of course, this is what I got. Actually, I didn't even get this. I stole this off the internet. If I had gotten this, I would have at least had something. Even though I did do some imaging on M82 with this configuration, it was just in the Luminance data, and I was having such poor luck with seeing that I've, I may end up just throwing that data out. But certainly nothing in terms of an image that I could show you and make a comparison. So this turned out to be an epic fail. I'll just have to come back later, maybe next month in June. Hopefully I will have had some time to complete some other projects probably with my refractors and then I can make a better comparison with the uh, filters, particularly the SHO filters with the Antlia filters to the ZWO filters. What is still up there? I still want to get a galaxy for the end of the galaxy season. We're closing in on the end here and now I just need to find that last galaxy uh, to get me into June and then I'll switch over and reconfigure to the refractors for nebula season. Now what I'm showing you here is some data from a program I wrote some time ago. Of course I've done some videos on this and I'll put some links in the description back to this tool that uh, some of you hopefully have used if you're interested. What you're seeing are galaxy targets. These are in the blue circles and nebula targets, the red triangles that are visible from my backyard. So it's taking into account my local horizon. What I'm doing is assigning an imaging score here on the vertical axis. So if I'm able to observe a target, say for more than 10 to 11 hours, then it gets a very high imaging score. If I'm only able to see a target for say three hours a night and it's only visible above the horizon, uh, by about 20 to 30 degrees, then it gets a very low imaging score. And as you can see, as we move from January through the heart of galaxy season, we are also getting the shorter uh, imaging nights that we have here in the northern hemisphere in the May, June, July time frame. And so the imaging scores drop, of course, because of that. We'll go into the DSO calendar that I made for long-range astrophotography imaging planning to do that. So what I've done is do a search on all nebula and galaxies that I can see from my backyard, and then went through each one of those and found a picture on the internet to see if we'll see what those those images look like and if it looked like something I wanted to take a picture of then I saved them and for January these are the targets that are available now what you see up here of course is the name of the target but you also see a date that date corresponds to the first day of the year for this particular target when I can have most observing hours for that target so in other words that's the day plus or minus a few days you would you would like to start imaging this particular target to get it done as quickly as possible the second thing you see up here is an imaging score. In some cases you have interesting targets like this pair of galaxies, but they're down at an imaging score of 0.14, which means they're way on my southern horizon and are blocked most of the time by my house. And second, they don't get all that high up above the horizon. And third, they're probably going to pass behind 
the chimney next door and I'll lose another 30 minutes because of that. On the other hand, if I'm dealing with an image or a target like this with an imaging score of 1.02, that's something that could conceivably be knocked out in two nights. But this is January. These are the targets that uh, if I'm looking ahead and trying to plan, what am I going to do? Uh, what's the best target for January? These are the targets that I would go to. They're mostly galaxies because we're coming out of nebula season and back into galaxy season. And then if you go into February, we're getting into the heart of galaxy season with lots of good galaxy targets because there's more targets than one slide can fill up. I went to a second slide. Again, more galaxy targets to possibly take a picture of. That even continues more so into March where you have a bunch of galaxies and three pages of galaxies for, for March. So lots of good galaxies in the heart of uh, galaxy season. Finally, in April, we have still more galaxies, but it's only one page. And finally, we're into May. I'm in May now, coming up into the end of May. And there's only four real galaxy targets at this stage. And if I go into June, there are no galaxy targets. It's all nebula. Let's go back and look at the last time we had galaxies right here in May. So I want to pick one of these four galaxy targets here to focus on literally and figuratively taking me into June and this will be my last galaxy target for the season. So let's go use the Nina Framing Assistant and see what each of these targets looks like. Well NGC 5850 it's kind of a twofer. You get the NGC 5850 and you get this elliptical galaxy over here. I'm not that keen on the elliptical galaxies. There's just not much frankly visual interest in a elliptical uh, galaxy so that's not that interesting. What I do see here, though, is a fairly interesting uh, spiral structure, barred spiral galaxy here, where you can get some decent uh, characterization, decent uh, definition of these two spiral arms coming off of the barred spiral galaxy. And this is this field of view you're looking at here is with my SCT at its full focal length, so not using the focal reducer. If we take a look at NGC 5746, it's an edge-on galaxy. Pretty good size uh, for, for this field of view. There could be some processing challenges that I might run into with a bright star right back over here. If we look at NGC 5921, I get another nice face-on spiral galaxy, about the same uh, extent as this galaxy over here. Once again, you can see some arms, several arms coming off, so it might be a pretty good target to come back to. And then finally, we've got NGC 5566. Now, this one is, is very interesting because it's actually a, a triad of three interacting galaxies. I suspect it's a pretty faint target. This galaxy is about 66 million light years away, so it could be a bit of a challenge to get enough uh, data on it to get a fair picture out of it. It shows an a set of interacting galaxies which I don't think I've ever tried before. So this one has really piqued my interest and uh, I think yeah I'm gonna go with NGC 5566 here uh, at the end of May and hopefully be able to wrap it up within the first two weeks of June if weather is uh, cooperative as it usually is in June here. It's just freaking hot. Now I need to go into Stellarium and see if I have a guide star that I can use to capture these now, I'm centered on NGC 5566 here, so you can see the three galaxies in this field of view of my uh, Celestron SET. I've also got the field of view of the uh, guide camera shown up here, and I'm oriented in such a way that the off-axis guider is on the long side of the, uh, the sensor, which also means that the prism of the off-axis guider is less likely to, to intrude on the image and cause a shadow. I like to keep the off-axis guider on the long side of the sensor so that it minimizes any shadow zone I get from the off-axis guider prism. This looks like I've got some decent stars here. These are about magnitude 11 plus, so they're, that's about the limit of what I can guide on with, uh, with any level of confidence. And the one thing you want to be sure of when you're you'll be imaging a target on both sides of the meridian is that you got to see where your off-axis guider is on one side and then look and see if you have stars exactly 180 degrees opposite of that because that's where you'll be on the other side of the meridian and in this case I've got a very potentially bright star in my field of view here that I can use to guide on so that looks like it may actually work out so yeah, it looks like this target is still a good one. It looks like this orientation of the off-axis guider and camera will work just fine. You notice I've got the clock down here set to uh, 4 a.m. This is, once we pull back out again, this is the last 
time, I can probably get some decent images out of it. It's actually already pretty low on the horizon at 18 degrees, so it's actually a little too low to be doing any real imaging. This cyan line is the fence line, so it's getting very low on the horizon. Now, at 4 a.m., I've still got an hour and a half of decent imaging time, but it's no point wasting any more time on this target. What is kind of interesting at this time, 4 a.m., is that if I scroll up here and go near the zenith, I get M57 up here. I haven't imaged this yet. M57, of course, many of you know is the ring nebula. It's a tiny target. Even in my full uh, SCT field of view here, the C925, it is still a tiny, tiny object and not one that I've tried to image before in part because it is such a, a tiny object in the field of view. But yet, I might as well, since I've got some imaging time left over when I'm done at the end of the night imaging 5566, I can just slew up to on the same side of the meridian, slew up to the ring nebula and catch your data on it for an hour and a half. And who knows, we'll just see what we get. So it's kind of a bonus target that I can use. Okay, so it looks like NGC 5566 is a keeper. That's going to be my last galaxy of galaxy season before I reconfigure and put on the ED-102 for some nebula targets here in June and July. What I really wanted to do with this video is to show a comparison of the an image I got with the Antlia filters versus an image I got with the ZD, ZWO filters and also show the comparison of the resolution or lack of loss of resolution using the focal reducer versus not using the focal reducer. Fate stepped in and kept me from seeing the sky for almost three months here so that didn't happen. I didn't get to finish any of the targets that I was trying to finish, and I'll just have to come back and make that comparison at a later date. I did get some actual hands-on use with the ADM replacement saddle for the EQ6R. I like it. It works well. It's well machined. It's at a reasonable cost, so I think that's good. It's not a necessary item, so if you don't want to buy it, don't think you're missing out on too much, frankly. I did make the RA axis nut adjustment finally. I tried multiple times before finally being able to get that darn thing loose. And it really does improve my ability to balance the RA axis. I haven't found that it, it made a huge difference in guiding. It certainly hasn't made guiding worse, so that's good. I'll just have to get more uh, data and more use outside under better scene conditions to see if I'm getting a net improvement in the guiding effect. So stay tuned for that. We'll come back to that in the future. Totally pleased with using Hocus Focus. I finally made the full conversion over to Hocus Focus, the autofocus using it for autofocus as well as star detection. I think it's working out great. I'm getting great results from it. The R squared values it provides are dead on accurate. The fits are dead on accurate. And now I've changed my R squared limit to 0.9. Then there was one galaxy that is. I finally decided that I'll use my remaining few nights of imaging uh, this galaxy season to try to capture the triad of interacting galaxies of which NGC 5566 is the centerpiece. And then that will be my last galaxy target of the season. So with that, I say clear skies, I hope, and I'll talk to you later. See ya.